Hello, everyone. Welcome. I hope you are enjoying Build. I hope you liked what you saw in the keynote. Today, I'm going to talk about something that is not a new thing that we just released. This is something that we released a couple of months ago. But it, there's not a lot of awareness to it. So I think and I hope that you will find this information useful. And without any further ado, let's just get right into it. I'm Julian Dominguez. I'm a developer in the Microsoft Patterns and Practices team. We are a small team, a very agile team. We tend to focus on providing guidance on the Microsoft platform. Um, this guidance comes in many forms. It, there is, we released several books uh, already. You might uh, notice them. They are the ones with the blue covers. These are also always accompanied with code. We always ship um, working code, like sample applications, big applications, um, that showcase everything that we sh shown. We focus on the end-to-end scenarios. We never talk just about one product. We try to put ourselves in the customer's shoes, and we actually meet with them very, very often and try to tackle the same challenges that they've face so uh, and be able to provide some guidance with their help with our expertise also um, we sometimes ship also reusable libraries um, one of the most known ones are the enterprise library or the prism uh, library um, right now i'm going to talk about something that is in the framework but also something in that it was released in the enterprise library, which is a new block called semantic login application block. It's completely new, but um, we, are, we are not going to focus on the other assets from enterprise library and so on. This is more of a um, talk to understand what semantic login means and also how the, um, this block can, can help you. So before getting into a solution mode, I want to relieve what are the typical uh, pains, challenges that we face when we want to consume logs, we want to troubleshoot our applications when they are misbehaving, or we want to gather some telemetry from the logs and, and whatnot. So I, I let, we'll do a brief introduction or a, a brief summary of what is that we are trying to uh, tackle with this. We are going to talk about a new class in .NET 4.5 called Event Source and how can it help, help us um, create better logs. And we are also going to talk about this new block and how uh, we can get all the benefits from the Event Source class and, but still work in a way that we are uh, accustomed to working. So the the reason why logs are typically a hassle to deal with is that they are mainly unstructured. They don't have any structure at all. They are basically a stream of strings, uh, very flat strings that are meant for um, humans to read upon. They might have a little bit of uh, structure like, okay, I want to say this particular entry is an error, it's a warning, it's a verbose message. In some cases, you might go even further, like, okay, I, I have all of my events provide an ID or some category, but then that's basically it. After that, it's I have an event, then a, a string, and that's all I get. So in my entire system, I might have different parts of my code base all throughout, sprinkled throughout the code that write some events, some entries, but they have no correlation with each other. They are very inconsistent with each other. It's very, very painful to, once you are trying to troubleshoot an issue, try to see what's there. I have a mess of, of entries and what is important in my logs, what is not, how to parse them, like mentally to troubleshoot, but even less likely is it that I will uh, have some automated tool to read those logs and provide some um, useful information for telemetry um, that can act upon a real-time stream of events. So 
we are mainly going to focus here on, on the desktop or the server or on the Windows Azure, not necessarily on Windows Store apps. So that's a, a disclaimer for, for, for you if you were to, if you came here to, to look at something new in Windows Store apps. This is mostly for the backend and also for the, for the desktop, for the full .NET profile. I wanted to quickly show a simple example of what, uh, just a, a, as a reminder of what an unstructured stream might look like. This is, doesn't matter what it's that, but it's basically sorting algorithm, and in different places we have some trace information. You can see that the developers chose to format strings containing some valuable information of, for example, I'm swapping some elements in my ar array. So he basically did a string dot format and passing all those values. And you can even see in a very small sample and you can extrapolate this to bigger and much more complex scenarios with tons of developer working on the same kind of issues that even here he defined in one case int array sub zero and then the same thing he mentioned it as element sub zero uh, with the different spacing. So this is basically for humans to read. It It would be very, very hard to have even doing some querying upon that data. It's just to, to look at it and try to understand it. Uh, regex would also be very hard to use here because they are not even called the same thing. Uh, and again, this is a simple scenario, but extrapolate with storing user IDs or some things that help you correlate some information in your entire subsystem. Why is this typically this way? In .NET, at least, this is um, uh, because of two things. It's because of the available tooling that we have. So all the different logging frameworks that are out there, including our old uh, logging application block in the enterprise library, this not, do not confuse it with the semantic, which is a new one, or log4net and log, uh, all of trace source in the .NET framework, they all produce mainly unstructured data or semi-structured data that is very hard to consume. They all allow you to put a string and potentially some other um, bits of information, but it's, they all have the same kind of workings. Um, semantic logging or structured logging is a different paradigm and at first, I will warn you, it might look like this is more cumbersome uh, you will have to, for example, create a strongly typed class for each of your event entries, which looks like a lot of ceremony, but this is by design, and, and you will hopefully see that it's not more work. It's putting the work in the right place. So um, this is an example of what an output log might look like. For example, if we were to store, persist our entries in Windows Azure tables, that you can see, for example, there, we have a human readable string with some bits of information, like I got five expensive, uh, expenses that are pending for approval. This is a, a log from a data access layer. Uh, but at the same time, I also preserve that same information that I flatten into a string also into its own uh, piece of data that can be queried, can be used by a tool. Right? You can see that I have a JSON object with my entire payload for that event entry in particular, but uh, and because of the dynamic nature of Windows Azure tables, I can also have a, a column for that particular event. Same thing, of course, can be said by different kind of uh, events. Not all my events in the system look alike. Each of the different types of, of event entries might have its own um, schema, so all the data is preserved. Of course, this is because Windows Azure uh, tables allows us to, to provide all these dynamic columns, but you can think of this, okay, in a SQL table, I might have my JSON blob there with all the payload information, but I not, might not have the dynamic uh, columns for, for additional payload items. Or I might choose to store this in an XML document or even in a flat file read all for humans, but this is a decision that I 
make when I'm deploying the application, I can change that decision, but I didn't lose all my information in the first call to logger.write and flatten all the string, the, the, the string there. So uh, you can even see that because I have all the arguments uh, there, I could even filter by a specific uh, payload argument. And, uh, and well, th this, could, th this shows a little bit of the power of how I might be able to consume that information. But we will also talk about how to produce data that is relevant, because this looks great once you have the logs, but you have to create the, the right logs in your application from the get-go. So we in Microsoft and also in Patterns and Practices want to um, change the way people think about logging. So most people think about logging about because their bosses come or the IT pros come or because they experience the pain in previous apps in production and they know that they might want to do troubleshooting in the future. We never write back free code. But most of the times we will focus on the developers will focus on the business logic of the application and do not focus on the login. He might uh, write a few trace statements and that's it. And it's like creating backups of your system or of your VMs and whatever, but never in your life try to do a restore. It's, you are in a wor world of pain if you try to do that. So we want you to think about the consumption and the purpose but we do not want to stress the developers while they are writing the business logic for their applications. So we want to clearly separate what we want to log from how we log it and where those logs go to. So we want to make sure that the, the effort is put in the right place. Um, this is a quote that, that we uh, like a lot from Mark Sim. If I see another unstructured log, I swear I'll defenestrate someone. That defenestrate is not actually a... a a made up work is the purpose of throwing somebody or someone out of the window. So it, it was actually used literally in, to throw out some political government people from the window in Prague. So <laughs> okay, so let's quickly go and see how this would look like in an application, what separating concerns actually mean. And we have a, a demo application. The whole source code is available for you to download. The, the goal of the application is not really relevant. It's mostly to showcase some of the enterprise library features. We will focus in this talk on the semantic login. It's a, an expense a submittal application. So in your company, you might want to submit your expenses. There's your manager that wants to approve those expenses so that you get a reimbursement. So that's the whole goal of the application. Um, in the sake of time, let's go and look. So for example, we do have um, uh, in some part of the system a repository that does the data access of our application. In this particular case, we have a method called get expensive for approval, which for the name is pretty clear what it does. It gets you a list of all the expenses. It might look at a cache. It might do some retry logic if the network is down. So there's a few things that it does. Again, for this app, it's not relevant. The thing is that we want to have some tracing built in, in our app. So you can see the first line that is commented out. That's what you typically do today with any login framework. So there's a um, syntactic sugar that each of these framework provide, but they basically have a static or a, uh, an entry point that is part of the framework that you say logger, log writer, whatever you call it. So write or write information in this particular case, and you pass a string, right? In this particular case, I want to also store some contextual information. I don't want just uh, any string. I want, okay, let me show what's the approver name, right? So the moment I did that, I 
flatten that part of the information, which is the approval name that I might find relevant in the future to query to filter, I put it inside a string. So now if the user wants to search for it, he will have to do some regex, some find in, in text files uh, to get that information. But basically, you had some contextual information, but then you put it inside a string, right? So you also had to, the developer had to stop and think, okay, let me try to understand what is the typical language I use in my application, in my entire system, to write these kind of entries. So in this case, uh, he's writing, of course, in English. He might want to try, in some case, to make it consistent to, to how all the other entries might look like. So this can be a, a contextual switch. He might spend 15 minutes just to think about what the entry might look like. Or in most cases, he might just type something and let the IT guys figure, figure it out later, which is <laughs> the most common approach. In some cases, they might go a little bit fancier like here, most frame framework allows you to put a, a string, or they also allow you to put some additional uh, structure like an event ID. They might um, also allow you to put a category or a source, in, in some cases, uh, the namespace of the class I'm using, some additional contextual information, but then again, the, the meat of the, the entry is still a flattened string, a flat string. If um, this doesn't do any enforcement, so if I use uh, an ID there of 320, as that's the example, now nobody guarantees that that ID is unique. So I might say, okay, I want to do logging very, I want to do it right, right? So I create maybe um, a shared class that have constants for all my IDs. So basically I'm trying to put some centralized logic somewhere that allows me to provide better logging. The same thing can be said of the category, right? So if you want to go fancier, you uh, start putting some centralized logic or, or some strongly typed classes in, in your code, but still there's no enforcement, no guarantee that you are doing it right. You can still have constants, but have duplicate ID anyways, right? So. This is what it would look like if you were to use the event source class in .NET 4.5. I'm not talking about enterprise library right now. This is built in the framework. So you basically create something custom for your application. Each of your entries will look like a strongly typed method. So this is for explicitness, but this is getting a singleton instance of my A expense events. In reality, you can use dependency injection, you can hold a variable with that information, but I wanted to make it clear. It's just something to get an instance of my login class. This is a custom class built for my app at hand. This is not a generic logger, a single entry point that my framework provides. So if we go into that, we see that the application, I just went to the definition of that method, we see that this is declared as a, um, as a custom implementation of the event source class there. That's the one that is part of the framework. Um, I call it A expense events. This is some conventions that I will not get into right now. We will see it in a few minutes, but it's completely optional for now. Let's try to think this is a simple class that just inherits from event source and provides a way of getting a singleton. There's tons of different ways of getting a singleton. I just, for an example, this is the simplest one, a public stat degree only field that starts that singleton. Then all that the developer needs to do is to create an implementation of that method that will provide the logging. What is, what is he doing? He's getting the expense for approval, and that's at the start of the method. So that's what I called it. It it's, doesn't get any simpler than that. I had some contextual information, like the approver name. You don't have to limit yourself to just one um, payload information. You, have, you can have more than one 
primitive type there um, that, that you want to pass in as contextual information. And then this is a call to a base a method called write event where you pass an ID and I will show you what it is in a minute and the same argument. So basically it's, this is a little bit of boilerplate code that we, I will also show you how we can help with getting that right. But it is actually pretty simple. So my developer or I as a developer was writing my business logic that was related to the repository. I was not thinking about tracing, but I just wanted to, I decided that I wanted to trace that just in case. I don't care about how it's going to be stored. So I create that method, then I go back to my code and continue. So it's like literally if you use Visual Studio to generate the method, would be like 30 seconds. Okay, each entry will add a new method to a class. That what typically looks like I don't want to write all those methods, but it's by design. So you effectively tell your system that you have a new event that you want to, to write. This is the bare minimum. This ID has to match this uh, ID that you put in the event attribute. And that's it. That you can get back to your business logic. Then at another po point in time, maybe before we're releasing or every once in a while, I, as the same developer in a different role or a different person, might come to this class with all my entries from the system and say, okay, I want to provide some consistency so not all the logs look uh, ugly or, or, or different. So you have all the power of doing refactoring in your system, like changing the name of, of the, the methods, but also you can provide some additional information here I will show you this is the exact same event with some more information. So previously we only had the attribute with the event ID and that's all we needed. Now we can add, and this is completely optional again, some further information like this is an informational event or a verbose or an error. I tag it there. I can also tell, um, add some more things like keywords. Keywords are like categories. So you typically, when you are persisting your logs, might tell, okay, I want to store only the error messages or only the warnings, but not the verbose information. So that's the first level of filtering that you typically have. Keywords allow you to filter, uh, further filter those. So you might want to get all the verbose messages that relate to data access, for example, right? So this one, is uh, coming from one of those classes I just skipped here that are completely optional, again, for a simple application. You don't even need to define any keyword, but you can define your own. This is just a flag. Um, well, uh, uh, it's a static class with some constant that behaves like a flat flag in them. And again, this is completely optional to let you far, further filter. The same thing, we have also tasks, which behave in a similar way to correlate um, tasks all throughout the end-to-end -end scenario. Like, for example, I might have a task related to getting an expensive for approval, but one is data access, one is user interface, and so on. So this allows you to, to tag it in that way. The opcode is a similar thing. I'm not going to get into the detail of when you should use each of those because we have a lot of documentation out there. I just want to get you a glimpse of what you can do. And of course, the other part that we were just missing, we created a strongly typed event, but if a user were to see it, he might see the name of the method and might not mean anything to him. So here you can provide your own message, uh, which is meant for pretty printing that event. And these tokens will get replaced by the contextual information in the payload itself. So basically, we just showed uh, how we separate the how, uh, the what to log from the how. This, in most of the frameworks, is coupled together because you have to make the, the decision at the moment that you're writing the event uh, what the, the pretty print message might look like. In most of the frameworks, uh, in the logging frameworks, of course, you have 
and a different separation, and this is still the case, where you can tell it, okay, now that I'm creating some entries, I want to only persist a few of those, like the ones that uh, have certain categories, uh, and you provide some filtering, so the destinations. Well, the event source class in .NET Framework do not provide any of those destinations by default. They um, provide support for using ETW, Event Tracing for Windows, which is something that allows you to send those messages out of process, and then you can use several different toolings to listen to consume those events and on the fly do some diagnostics. Well, they also provide an extensible model uh, for doing, um, for sending those same events in the same process, but there's no listeners. There, there's no subscribers to those. So that's where um, the semantic logging application block from Enterprise Library comes in. It's to bridge that gap. So here we can go and add a reference, a NuGet package. Here I just can search for slab. That's the, the acronym for semantic login application block. Um, the, the core that I need is the semantic login application block, which provides some destinations such as flat files, rolling flat files, console, and so on. I'm going to install that. But there's also two more in there. Um, for example, we can, as we saw the example, send it to a Windows Azure tables. So the reason it's separate is because it has other dependencies, such as the Azure SDK. So in case you don't need it, you, we are not going to, to install anything for you. But if you do want it, you just install it. And once you have the reference in your application, there's the, the part that you have to hook it up. So because this is a website, I'm going to go to my application start, and I can say bar listener. <coughs> flat file log, I add the correct using statement in there. This is the only part that is using semantic login. Again, the previous code was not referencing anything from enterprise library, just the framework. And I create a listener. I can, of course, assign a file name, my log.txt. You, we also provide some formatters like JSON, XML, or, or plain text. And this is pretty straightforward. I just created the listener. I now have to enable it. So I just created the listener, but I didn't tell it what to listen to. I want to enable the events coming from the A expense uh, events class. That's the custom class I just showed you. I'm going to get the, the singleton object for it, the singleton instance. And of course, as such as in any login framework, I can tell it I want only errors. And I could also include keywords. I want to log all the keywords. Or uh, uh, this filtering, you can do it later in the, in the, um, when you are ready to ship to production. If you don't listen to any, any of the verbose messages, there will be almost zero perf hit in your application, so you can be sure to write everything that you might find relevant in the future, but then if nobody listens to that, you're good, no harm done to the application, the application still behave, uh, and it's very fast, it's not producing anything extra. Um, so I guess that's it. Uh, we do have, of course, this is the flat file, we have several things, and let me show you let me go back to the app. So let's talk about some of the technologies that are at play. I briefly mentioned event tracing for Windows or ETW. This is something that is not new, not new at all. It has been part of Windows for a very long time, several years. Um, the reason why you might not be familiar is that it is very native to Windows. The hooks in .NET were not very good. So um, in order to publish events through to ETW, which ETW supports sending all my entries to a separate process using kernel buffers is extremely fast. 
but the thing is that you have to have somebody on the other end listening to those those entries, but at the same time you have to produce those messages in a strongly typed manner, like you have a manifest that you had to install in the past. Right now uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit simpler, but it, you would use tools that are work outside of Visual Studio, maybe to generate some of the, the code, the strongly typed classes, but it was unfamiliar for .NET developers. So the event source class, which is new in the framework in .NET 4.5, um, makes that authoring experience a little bit easy. Um, it does provide support for everything that you wrote on that custom class that you created that inherit from event source. All those things, by using some reflection, it will generate an, a manifest on, on the fly, and it will publish uh, to ETW um, all those events, if nobody's listening, there's no penalty, again. There's uh, a secret handshake that whenever there's a, a consumer of those events and it tells you what I'm interested in listening to, like the keyword, the level, and so on, then the application will start sending those events only. And still, the, if you decide to uh, send everything, it's still very, very performant. But at the same time, it also is extensible. The event source infrastructure is extensible. So you can even, without going to ETW at all, in the same application, in the, in the running process, you might want to listen to those same events. But uh, again, by default, it doesn't come with any subscriber. You can create your own subscriber if you want to. So this is where Slab comes in, to bridge that gap, in a, in a sense, where you are familiar with writing to flat files, you are familiar with writing to SQL or even Windows Azure tables. So uh, you want to still use those familiar destinations. So uh, again, w by adding this, um, you get those. Uh, th this allow also allows you to work with event source without any knowledge of ETW at all. We do provide some uh, service that uses ETW if you want to, but uh, still it, it, it doesn't make you have to think about ETW at all. And also we do provide some, some tooling to help you author the custom event source class, derived event source class. So uh, let's quickly go and I'll let you read the different destinations that, that we support. We do not support, um, just as a disclaimer, because a lot of people ask it, we do not support the Windows event log as a destination. In the future, we do hope that the event source class infrastructure itself um, will allow you to send um, to the different channels uh, that ETW supports, and one of them allows you to, to go to event log. For some of our text-based things, because uh, again, you can still use um, text-based things such as flat files. We do provide a few formatters or you can write your own. We also ship an out-of-process service which is uh, basically an EXE that you can run standalone as a Windows service or as a console application. So um, you basically download um, an EXE, you configure it using an XML because instead of using the programmatic approach that we just saw, you just have an EXE. So you configure the same things in XML files. This um, will listen out of process, so your target application, the one that you're monitoring, just has to have the event source class, not any reference to the semantic login application block at all. It's, this is just a consumer of ETW. Some of the benefits is that if you are using some syncs such as SQL or Windows Azure, which uh, it would be very harmful for your application to stop and block on each entry to send it to the sync, we of course buffer those entries. And if your application were to crash after, immediately after it uh, sent the, the entry, you, you might lose that event, but if you're going ETW, then the it's the, um, the, the goal of the other process to pick that up and drain all those messages and send them to the destination. So uh, basically it allows 
a little more resiliency when sending the, the, the logs. It also moves, this is not a, a big benefit in my opinion, because it moves the overhead from your application that performs the logging to a separate process, but it's still on the same CPU, so there's not a big benefit there. But it also allows you with one single service to monitor um, several different components, several different services in your application with just one central place that your IT pros can edit the configuration without touching the application code itself. It does come with some disadvantages, of course, because there's more moving parts. It's n not everything under the control of the developer that uh, you have to make sure that the service is running w once the application starts so you don't lose events and so on. So there's power, f uh, power features, but at the same time, you have to manage it more closely. So I would recommend when you're starting up, you're playing with it, just use the semantic logging in process and once you want to ship, figure out, okay, now exactly what I want to do with uh, the persistence of my logs. And, and this cleanly allows you to separate. You didn't make any commitment to semantic logging. It's just, uh, you saw in the application startup code, that's the only place where the semantic logging is hooked up. The rest is all framework code. Um, this is, uh, I will, show a very quick demo. I will not go through all the steps in the sake of time of uh, what the configuration might look like. This is, um, instead of using code, I just download the exe with the, um, with the out of process service. I can configure it. I can have several different syncs. In this case, I'm using the flat file sync and and log into a file called a expense data access log. I can provide all my what to listen to. This is the similar call that we saw um, in the past that we call enable events. Here we are saying that we want to enable events coming from the a expense event source. We say that we want to log everything. This could be filtering through errors, warnings, and whatnot. And the keywords, which was that flag that we saw that with a constant. So this is basically allowing you to do all the same things that we saw in code, but outside of the application, then we go to our console, or you can start, uh, install it as a Windows service, so when the application starts up, it will start listening to events. And I just run the exe. In this case, I'm going to run it in console mode. and. With just that, I'm listening. There's absolutely no reference in my application. Well, in this case, the, the demo, I just added the reference, but I could safely remove it, and the application would already be monitoring those events. Um, let's go back, because there's more to show, more to see. These are some additional features, not really for the runtime, this is mostly for helping you author the event source class. Remember that there was some boilerplate code that we saw that we had to write in the event source class. Um, this will help you validate that everything is correct, that a proper manifest will be able to be uh, generated from that class. There is some static check in the framework, but there's a few cases that it misses. So, for example, um, here's, a, here's a, one example. You can have this run as a unit test or in the back mode when your application starts up if you don't have unit test in your application. But basically, this will throw an exception if, if there's an issue with it and your unit test will go red and it would be very easy to figure out what went wrong and, and fix it. Here in that example, you can see that the event used in the attribute 111 does not match the, the same ID uh, that you pass into the method for write event. This seems trivial, but at the same time, when you're copy-pasting code, you might get it wrong. 
So especially boilerplate code is the stuff that you copy paste around and, and you might get wrong. It, it will also verify that the order of the parameters in your, in your method are in the same order that you pass it to the right event call. Because again, this is generated, the manifest is generated from re reflection, but then at runtime you might be sending different stuff. So we quickly validate all those. There, there's several edge cases that you might get wrong while, while copy pasting, so we just flag those in a, uh, and throw an exception. This is um, a cool feature for some people that everything is observable based. So the, um, the entries, the stream of events that are coming out of my, uh, my system are a stream of events in the, in the sense that they implement iObservable, the iObservable interface. I will show you what it means in a, in a second if you're not familiar with it. All the syncs, all the destinations, like the, the Windows Azure Table sync, the flat file syncs, they are all observers. We internally hook up those two, so you don't have to think about it if you don't care about it. But at the same time, it allows you, if you do care about, use reactive extensions as a way of filtering that real-time stream of events before actually persisting them. So it's not like you just select, oh, I want all my errors, and then every error that comes in gets to the log. You can use um, transformations, like think about reactive extension is a library to process um, real-time asynchronous collection of events in the sense, it's not a, a, a collection that is there, it's an enumeration of events that comes in, you pre-process it, you do select statements, you transform it, you buffer it, you do whatever you want with it, and then you send them to the sync. So it's a framework that was basically, that's the whole purpose, it's to, to, to work with it as you do with uh, collections with link queue. So let's quickly show an example of some, some place where you would find this useful. Um, this is a very simple application where, of course, you can extrapolate it to a, a business app. I just have a few buttons in here that each of them log a particular entry. Uh, let me zoom it a little bit. So I have a, a button that logs information message, a button that logs warnings, and a button that logs errors. This, of course, you will get them due to bugs or whatever, but uh, this is just for the demo purposes. So imagine in your application, you, you find your errors very valuable to your system. It's a way to troubleshoot errors. But in many cases, you might get a, an error, and if we look at here, we open the log file, you get, okay, uh, this is an unhandled exception, in this case, because it's a demo, oops, something happened here. Go figure out how we reached that point. How many times did that happen? Like, you get an error, but you, are not, you do not have the entire context on what led to that error. Even though with semantic logging, you can add some more context, but in some cases, it's just a bug you didn't thought about previously, right? So, um, what we typically do is, okay, because I want to troubleshoot a bug, let me close the app. Let me delete the log also so that there's no noise. When you troubleshoot the app, you might um, say, okay, I'm getting an error. Now uh, let me bump up the verbosity of my, my log. So I do have all the verbose messages that I didn't want to have before because they will just uh, have a, a massive amount of information in this space or whatever, but it, it's still, you don't want everything to be stored all the time just because once in a lifetime you might get an error. Or you might want, but you have to pay for the storage. That's fine. In many cases, you might want to, it wouldn't be nice if you had a way that the moment I get an error, I would like to get the previous 100 messages, the verbose messages, and flash them to disk. That's a, a typical scenario that we, we have. So because we have reactive extensions, we are able to do something like that. 
that. So in the um, previous demo, we showed the usage of this way of creating the listener. Basically, I was newing up a file flat log that had the listener embedded in, telling it that the destination is the file flat, uh, the flat file, sorry. This is another way of newing up objects in semantic logging. I can get an observable event listener, which basically is just a listener. It's not hooked to any sync in particular. I, of course, can enable what you listen to. In this case, I'm listening to everything, even information and messages. And then I get that listener, which is an I observable implementation, and I tell it to log to flat file. If you are familiar with reactive extensions, that it's completely optional for this to work within not need reactive extension, you would call listener.subscribe and pass the observer, right? Here, we do provide some useful extension methods like log to console, log to flat file. If I had the database NuGet package installed or the Windows Azure table, you would see those methods too. So there's um, no dependency to, to, to reactive extension and you don't even need to know about it. But if you do care about it, then you can go to your NuGet packages, add a reference to reactive, and I'm searching for Rx, which is the, the typical way of getting it. I install it. Again, completely optional, not required by Slab. Now that everything is installed, I'm going to cheat here. I have a, a hidden class that I will include in my project. This is, the, all this code is available for you to download, so I want to just give a quick glimpse of it, but we'll not get into the details. This is a few lines of code that um, will filter events, and the moment that you get certain condition, it will flash to the source, and let me show you how it will look like. So before sending all my entries to a flat file, I want to intercept this and say, I want to flash and trigger. This is the extension method I just included in my project. I'm going to get an entry, and I'm going to say, if the entry, the level of the entry is an event level of error or bigger or a critical warning, only then I want to flash and I can tell it I want my buffer, this is a circular buffer that holds a reference to the last few events. In this case, I'm going to make it three, you can make it 100, this is just for demo purposes. But I want to um, store and buffer in memory the last three events and only if that condition is met, the, the one that I pass in there is met, then I want to flash everything that is in my buffer. If I were to run this application, I can uh, click, uh, hold on a second, it's running. Okay, I'm going to click, I'm clicking several times on the log information and, and log warning messages. If I, I didn't click on log error, if I want to open the file, I see that nothing is there as expected. The, the messages are not being persisted. But the moment I click on log error, I click there, I see that the buffer is flashed. And I can know what led to my, er my error. So there's a tons of possibilities here. Like this is completely up to you what you want to do. You can gather some telemetry and act upon certain conditions with meant if you get a, a few of, of my event ID five and then a, a different ID, I want to send an email to my administrator. There's a tons of possibility. Uh, one that we heard also a lot is for example, uh, I might have a system that is a distributed system. Some point in time is calling up another subsystem and there might be some connectivity issues, maybe transient for a minute, but that minute that the network went down, I might get thousands, millions of events, of errors. I don't care about the 99999 
I just want the first one, and potentially one at the end that tell me, okay, I just silently uh, swallow all the other entries. You just got the, the, the one error, right? So that's something that you can do yourself with reactive extensions. And, and be more conscious of what you actually persist. So then when you are troubleshooting an issue, it's not like finding a needle in the haystack. It's really the information, it's right there. Um, now, from this session, what I want you to do is to evaluate the semantic login application block. You can find it on Nougat. Uh, just search for Slab, and you will get the three packages that are part of Slab. This has no dependency to other blocks in an enterprise library. There's no dependency in common. We try for the, this new version to make it very lightweight, so you only get what you want. And this is a, a brand new block, which is very, very lightweight. So I suggest you to play with it. This, again, is a stepping stone if you want to. So this is production ready. But if you, in the future, decide to use some other custom tooling or some Windows tooling that uses ETW, you can use it. You are not bound to the semantic login. The thing is that you shouldn't use trace source again or any of the unstructured login frameworks again. Use event source, which is the way to go in the future. It w puts the effort in the right place again. Uh, it, it lets you think about login purposely, but not with a lot of effort. It's just the effort that is in the right place. Read the, the docs. We ship some docs that talk uh, about the semantic login application block, but also semantic login in general or structured login in general. So this is in preview form right now. Uh, we will have it in uh, online MSDN also in the future. Right now it's a PDF that you can download from Coplex. If you find this useful, we are currently in feedback listening mode, in standby mode in this project. Uh, we want to hear from you. If you also would like to see this in Windows Store apps, which um, some people are already talking to us about it, they would like to have a way of doing some centralized logging, maybe not logging to a SQL database, but for the, their business applications, they might want to use mobile services to, or a backend service to send those, um, those logs to. So uh, if you think that's a good idea, go to the user voice and, and vote for it or send us email, harass us, do whatever you want. We are very customer driven. So again, uh, patterns and practices is a, small, a small team but very agile, so we work on what's valuable for people. So if you find it useful, please tell us. These are some resources that I will uh, leave up there for you if you want to play with it. Um, without anything else, let's go into questions. Uh, thank you. Yes. You can use the Microsoft phone that is there. Say the user clicks a button on the UI um, that may invoke several components in the system. How do I get log messages uh, that corresponds to that unit of work? Should I code in my program, or is there any inbuilt support in the semantic logging that uh, correlates all the logging messages from all these components? for that unit of work. So you're talking about if you have a task that might span uh, several different things and you want to correlate them. Like yes. So right now, the event source infrastructure is adding in the future a new property called activity ID that would be for just that. In, if you look at uh, semantic login today, you won't have that feature because we needed something in the framework in the first place. I believe it might be already out, or if it's not, uh, I would encourage you to check it out. But the activity ID property will allow you to do something like that and correlate everything. So that is not available in the current version, but uh, exactly. it will be available in the future. Yes. Okay. And the framework itself 
already defines a few uh, event source implementations, like custom implementations. So they already, the framework itself, is producing events. If you're interested in listening to what's going on in the framework, you can subscribe to it. For example, you, you get events when ASP.NET is um, handling a request. You get events when you create a new task using the task parallel library. You will get, uh, and that is a way that you would be able to do some correlation of the end-to-end -end, um, workflow. Right, I might need to include, say, the session ID or session key all the way to all the log messages, so. Yes. Okay. Uh, you, you in the future will be able, and if people ask us also, we might be able to help with that, to provide some tooling that will correlate all the activities IDs. When, so when you spawn a new task, uh, you get an event saying, okay, you used to have activity ID one, now it's called activity ID 10, make sure that you correlate your work. So the tooling, the, the, the visualizer could have that information and track everything all the way to, to your database from the front end. Okay, thank you. Makes sense? Two, yes. two questions. Go uh, ahead. First, was it out of scope in your example, or how, do you, how would you approach having like dynamic, dynamically modifiable configuration? So if I want to like have a, like a watched config file that says, oh, I just got an error, I want to turn on verbose, verbosity, and then, I, oh, the error is, I got it now, I got my info, I'll just turn it off. Right. Yeah, so we actually do ship already, it's in complex, some quick starts that would monitor, for example, a CS config setting if you're in Azure, that would allow you to bump up the verbosity because you change a config setting. That's in process. On Azure. What about, what about like, a, like, a, a desk, like on a server? Right, you, a you can, server? we also provide something that you can monitor an app setting or a, or a file to change uh, programmatically the configuration you might want to the developer might want to build that or if you are using the out of process service which is already a declarative approach it will monitor for changes so whenever the file changes it will automatically switch the the configuration and bump up the verbosity in this case and okay. yep the other question was uh, t a totally separate direction but as referencing ASP.NET health monitoring which is a little bit older stuff how do you see this, you know, if there's apps out there that use health monitoring, how can they leverage this or how would you leverage that? I honestly don't have the, the answer for that. This is uh, mostly to replace the, the login infrastructure that the application developers have. So to monitor the health, the, uh, you could either build custom tooling or, or use these other tools, but it, it's, really a, a different goal, even though you might want to use it for a similar purpose, but the, the goal is for your log entries to reach out a destination without loss of fidelity. Does it make sense? I think you're saying that health monitoring, are you saying health monitoring is different than logging? Uh, yes, so lo logging contextual information of the app, uh, yes, right? It, it, this is more for tracing and try to troubleshoot something that is going on in your business logic, for example. Okay. Got it. So, so remember that you have a strongly typed class that you created for a specific purpose. So each of those entries would have its own method. It's not like doing some aspect-oriented programming where you intercept every method call and just log anything. You actually purposely define what's the right context for a particular entry. So you're basically creating a story with your strongly typed classes. A story? Well, in a way, I mean, like you, this is what's happening in the app. These exactly. are the yes. semantics of the app. Exactly. The, the developer, when he's writing the business logic, says, this might come handy. I will log it. I don't care how at this point. This is the contextual information I have. Let me get down to, to continuing the business logic and then on a different end, a, a different developer, an architect or an IT pro, in conjunction with the developer, sits down and says, okay, let me assign all these different keywords and make sure that then I can consume, right? So it's by design like that. Okay, okay? makes sense? Thank you.
As we continue to grow kind of like the client side um, our application stack, we, we found that, you know, for a lot of the tricks and whatnot and tool sets we have available for server side event logging doesn't really have a unified approach to, to kind of complete application visibility. Do you have any patterns, practices, or roadmaps to give us uh, some way to, to combat like a consistent logging framework from client side and server side development? Okay, so the event source class is there in Windows Store apps, for example, but there's no syncs at this time. Uh -huh. So you might, w you might want to st uh, start writing that, but today you do not have a way to persist those entries at the moment. So if you're in, your administrator on the machine, you can hook up ETW and listen to those events being consumed. But for a consumer application, that's typically not possible. You start through the Windows Store and you do not get that capability. So uh, this is what I was mentioning. If people would like to see that, we, they would like to have some application installed through the store and being able to send those entries to some centralized server or uh, Azure, then please let us know. But, but we do envision and we would like to get to that point. We just need some feedback, some some way of going up the manager change and say this is something that we should invest on. Okay, but same pattern whether it be a native phone app or a, a web app, more about an event source likely to an Azure back um, store? Right, yeah, so um, it is definitely useful to do some logging on the client side. Yeah. There's a lot of things that at least as a good practice we tend to just make sure that the server is doing. We do not, in many cases, especially for consumer apps, we do not want to do all the heavy processing in the client and then having a server be a dumbed down version that just accept, accept whatever comes in. Yeah. So there's a place there when you do the network call to do the login in there. So, but in line of business application, that tends not to be the case. So. I, I don't know if I have a, an answer for you, but at, at this point, if you would like to use something like event source, you would have to tell us. We really want it. Okay, thank you. All right. I actually have a couple questions. Um, one was around the the sync that was in Slab, the console app that you demonstrated. Is if that's if that's tracing like ETW events, can that carry any ETW event? Like I work with the cat. Team BizTalk um, uh, Trace, is a, and that is the ETW event, but you don't actually have a sync. You just have to write the sync for it all the time. Right, yeah, so we built this mainly uh, and just for the uh, ETW events coming from event source, source. class. Okay. So we do have a way of, so remember that ETW, you have to install a manifest. Yep. The event source class, do not need a manifest, but it does send a manifest dynamically when the applications, or, or the first time that the producer and consumer hook up. So we do have a way to dynamically parse and persist those logs. So even you might, that you might be able to use it to capture any ETW trace, it was not built for that. So there's other tooling for it, but yeah. So okay, right now it's. My second question is on the RX extensions. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with those, but I do with Stream Insight. So one of the things on the correlation was um, another gentleman asked about correlating different events, and you, you mentioned of using the event, the event ID or event source ID um, as a correlation. Can you, if I used event source and had different, had some aspect of it that was the same, they say, for example, maybe not event ID, but some other data element that would be the same across, can I correlate it across events, like event types? do that in the same manner. Uh, yeah, you have okay. all the power of reactive extension. Perfect. You get the entry, you can do whatever you want Perfect. with it to filter, project. Okay, yeah. all right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, last question. This question might be a little out of scope, but um, we're currently going through a stage of local, localiz localization of our platform. So our, our GUI, our front end, we're trying to get into many diff different languages, especially as we expand the European market. Um, if we spend time, which we need to, to create a more structured logging system, all of those partners that we have who are also developers or scripting using our platform, we have to localize the logs. And that can be very problematic. So rather than hiring people to um, 
I guess maybe use the database or something that you would be able to cross-reference for their installed instance of our platform and say this is the log they use in their language, say this type, this is the class, and this is the message of the log. Are, what would be your best approximation of how to go about local, localizing the output of these logs? Not just the message themselves per se, because these, our partners are also techs and developers. So maybe they want to see it's of this type, the, like maybe enumeration of public constant, like this is the type of log. Obviously, it's got to be translated. So it might be a third-party framework to go about doing that. I don't know if you had an idea. Right. <laughs> yeah, so there's several possibilities. So at w you mentioned at one point, the event source class has support for localization, so you can produce something okay. with the, the right language from the get-go. Really? In, in, um, multi-tenant application, you might not be able to just switch the language dynamically, mm -hmm. but you are storing the entire payload, the entire structure in there. There's nothing that prevents us, uh, prevent you to go to the manifest and doing the, the mashup, like the, the message that you saw, that pretty print message, the, the human readable message, is part of the manifest itself. You can have the manifest in many languages and get the, the right string by looking at the same payload arguments that you sent. So the, the, the manifest would be, would have to be built per se by our, you know, our, our team in the different languages and you would just say for this platform manifest dot, you know, ES dot or, or whatever it may be to, to, to message out that specific model. There's no like um, on the fly translation per se yet or that'd be an extension per se. Uh, well at this point the localization story is not great in the sense that you cannot dynamically change it all the time. Okay. It, it's, I think it's, I don't know if it's the current tr thread or, or how it gets the, the, the language at this point. Okay. But the thing is, you are allowed to have manifest in different uh, languages. But what I was telling you, even if you can't create the, the entries on the fly in the, the required message, in the required language, sorry, you can also store all the information so that when you are reading, you are querying for that information, you, can translate that. you then mash up, mash up the, the, the payload with the right language. So you can even look at the same entry with different languages. Right? Does, does it make sense? Yeah. You d do the translation only after the, the entry has been Add persisted. Okay. okay, perfect. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. One last question. So we'd be very interested in the SQL portion, being able to write out a log that can be easily be consumed by SQL instead of using XML, but on the C++ platform. So what from the slab might you be thinking about doing for C++? Because right now, doing all the instrumentation for ETW manually is a pain, even, even with manifested uh, ETW events. We've looked at it, and for something that's you know, millions of lines of code and hundreds and hundreds of different events, it would take an entire team just to rewrite all of our eventing in ETW. So are there any shortcuts that you're looking for or slab enhancements for the C++ platform? I honestly do not know the, the answer, so to tell you you can go this route. You might be able to look at the out-of-process service, which does some parsing on the fly. And if, I think if you have an installed manifest, it will use that. So you might be able to produce and store in, the, in similar things by having events coming from something that is not an event source, uh, uh, like using the event source class in .NET. So are you talking about C++ native or are you? C++ native. OK, right. I mean, because they've gone away from the traditional ones. We have to write all the classes and now do it with manifest. Right. They're not, they're not as not a lot of other tooling that's available to make it that one step easier. Give me some subscribers that are easy to use. Because like you said, you have to install everything. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't have a solution right now. There are some tooling like PerfView and some other general purpose tooling. I don't know. You can, again, you can definitely vote for it. Uh, it's not on the roadmap right now, but it's definitely a good idea. Not at this point. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Thanks for staying to the end.